Welcome. Welcome back to the Captimizer podcast. We've got another awesome guest today, retired chief of police, Tammy Hooper. She's had an amazing career, uh, finishing uh, her career as chief of police in Asheville, North Carolina, but a lot of stuff leading up to that. A lot of great lessons that we're, we're going to pick up on today. So I'm going to start right now and say, hello, Tammy. How hey, are you? I'm, I'm <laughs> doing great. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, we're both coming off long weekends, had great weekends. Uh, I'm excited for this conversation. And I'd love for you just to start by uh, giving the audience a little bit of history of who Tammy Hooper is and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, I mean, career-wise, I did a total of about 32 years of uh, active law enforcement. Started off actually uh, working with the Arlington County Sheriff's Office in the jail back in uh, 1987 um, and uh, worked in there for a little over three years. Then, um, you know, I mean, working in the jail was an interesting experience at that time. And that was right at the beginning of the crack epidemic that took off in the D.C. metro area and throughout the country. And uh, so what I was seeing coming in through the jail, it really inspired me to want to get out on the street and take a, have a different sort of role in how we were working, you know, to, to protect people in our communities uh, with regard to that. And so uh, in 1989, I went to the, gosh, I'm thinking about this. I must've started in 86 because I was there for like three years. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so old now. I can't even remember what day of the week it is. It's really, it's just factual. You know, that's, it's um, the curse of retirement, right? Like, <laughs> it is. Every day is Friday. Every day is Friday. Um, yeah, I did. I started in 86. Anyways, in 1989, I went to Alexandria Police Department. Um, and I ended up spending 26 years there. Uh, started off, obviously, patrol officer, the whole deal. Um, worked my way through the department, through the ranks and all, and ended up as a deputy chief of police. Um, I retired from there in 2015 and took the job as chief in Asheville, North Carolina. And I was there until I retired in 2019. So um, long time, a lot of things happening in the world during that time, a lot of things impacting policing during that time and uh, communities and relationships with communities. And uh, so I think it's just a lot to draw on in terms of like experience and perspective uh, when we look at you know, how we're doing today and, and where we really should be focusing our attention. Um, what I've been doing since 2019, I'm, I consult my company, uh, Unit One Consulting. Um, it, um, I've worked on uh, consent decree monitoring teams. Um, I've done some international work and um, currently also I'm working as a, a strategic advisor at, uh, for Axon Training. And uh, that's got to be probably, I'll say, like the most fun job that I <laughs> that I do because Axon is uh it's just a fun place to work. You know, I was a huge supporter of a lot of the work that they've been doing at Axon. And I know um, you know, while Axon coaching, you know, you know, is a separate entity from from Axon, the company Axon, uh while I was chief, we we made some significant investments in Axon technology and and you know uh one of the cool things that I like about Axon is, you know, in, in the policing world, we don't have R and D budgets. Uh, so when you're when you're trying to when you have ideas about things that you think could be, you know, game changers or really impact in a positive way the work that our police officers are doing, uh, you need partners. And you know, I know there's a lot of great companies out there that are doing a lot of great work, but I've uh, I'll just give a quick shout out to to Axon and 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 you say you're working in uh, with Axon training because Axon has really taken a uh, uh, a big step forward in the training realm where they're looking to bring uh, some world class training to uh, to the company to provide to uh, police departments and police officers around the country and that's another thing that I I, I think is really interesting because. Uh, you know, one of the things that we'll kind of get into in our conversation today is really you can have the best technology uh, and the best equipment out there, but we're still human beings behind that technology and equipment. And in order to make it all work really well together, yet you really have to optimize your people. Um, and that's, you know, obviously my, uh, you know, that's 
I love that that theory of cop optimization and and yeah, so that that's cool stuff. I, I want to back up just real quick. Working in the jail, um, how old were you when you started working in jail? I was twenty. Twenty years old. So now, uh, and Alexandria is a beautiful. If, if you've never been to Alexandria, especially Old Town, Alexandria, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful area. You know, as a kid, I lived in the Philadelphia area before I moved to the Midwest, but. And I just, I just got a taste of this being, you know, on a visit back out East, but it's so interesting to see the difference between East East coast, Midwest, West coast, uh, and just like architecture, things like that. I mean, it's old town. Alexandria is that it's, it's one of our oldest communities in the U S just beautiful architecture, just a cool place. Home of the IACP, right? Yep. It sure is. Um, yeah, so when I started, uh, I was in the Arlington County Sheriff's Office in, right next door to Alexandria. And um, the jail there, so this is like 86, 87 through 89, whatever. It was an old, it's not the current place where they have a jail. It's like this was an old place. It was an old jail and courthouse. Um, and the, during this time, like we still had the booking area, you know, the receiving cells had bars on them. And um we we would when officers brought their prisoners in they would sit them on we had church pews they would sit them on the church pew handcuff them to a, a rail behind the pew you know and then we would get to them one at a time book them in and, and do that process but it was a really interesting time uh the mid to late 80s was an interesting time because we were really going through a huge um i guess explosion of of crack in the community. So we're, we're thinking about where we are. We're in Washington DC metro area and we're, it's leading up to DC eventually becoming the murder capital of the U S during that time frame. Um, so you start to see the drive by shootings and all of the impact of what the, this crazy drug was doing in our communities. Um, and so it was a strange time, maybe strange, but just maybe just interesting time to be part of that, you know, process in that community and working in a jail is it is a hard thing to do it's something where i think we don't um give a lot of love or attention to corrections uh and that corrections work in our in our uh, country you know historically but it's a big deal to be in that environment um now during the time i was there we were still had you know women were not allowed to work the floor in the maximum security area uh, men were not allowed to work in women's quarters. And so there was a, we've come in, you know, sort of been into a different place now than where we were then. Um, but nonetheless, there was a lot going on in terms of like murders, aggravated assaults, shootings all the time. Uh, and it just, to me, like as a young person, how we did it uh, at that time in the jail is we'd come to work in the jail and then you had to be 21 to go to the police academy. So I had to work in the jail for like a year-ish, not, maybe not quite a year. And then finally got to go to the police academy after I was 21. Yeah, but that's a, you know, you learn a lot in the jail and you are dead on. I mean, it is one of the most underappreciated and most necessary jobs in America. And we're seeing like what's happening in Florida right now, where what, what can happen in the pressure on the system when you can't find sufficient staffing to work in a jail. I mean, I... I mean, well, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. But, you know, when you activate the National Guard and others uh, to go in and, and work in your jails. I, you know, oh, no, that's that's not OK. That's, yeah, that, that is that, not OK. Um, you, you know, that's, that's a, that takes a different you know, that's a there's a lot of training. There's a lot of you know, there's a, there's a high level of understanding that you have to have working in that environment. I just don't you know. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how it works. And I know I said, you know, they were like, well, we'll take only trained staff and put them in certain places. But, man, I I don't know. I'll you, you sit back and watch this one. That's military in a law enforcement capacity. It's a problem in this country because they don't the rules of, are so different. That operate and the rules of engagement are completely not aligned, you know. And so and it, it, I mean, it's just that's it's problematic all the way around, but yeah, I mean, corrections is a very interesting, it's, it's, it's its own thing. There are people who are experts in, in that field. And, um, if, you know, it wasn't for me, I, uh, I, I loved the guys I was working with and I understood why we were doing, you know, why we did, did and what the importance of that is. 
Um, but when I was seeing what was going on outside the, outside the walls, like, it was like, okay, I want to be out there. I want to go do that. Um, I want to be involved with that. And so, so you take those lessons from inside of the jail because that, you know, as a 20 year old, I mean, I, you know, I don't, don't know necessarily where you, you know, know how you're raised or where you come from. But for, you know, for me, I, I came from a Catholic family, um, you know, pretty, you know, your typical middle class stuff. And so when I actually started, I, I was in the military even and before I went to college. And then even when I got out on the street, you know, there was a lot of lessons that I had to learn the very, you know, the hard way when I first got out there. So you're 21. Uh, you get to take those lessons from inside the jail. Um, so, yeah. And well, then- it's interesting. So I'll tell you what the, what I think is really valuable. And that was, I mean, I learned a lot in the like three ish years that I was in there. I was 23 when I went to the police department and what I think one of the things that when the people move from a corrections environment out to being an officers on the streets, one of the most important things is like in the jail environment, you have to know how to talk to people. Your communication is, on a whole different level, right? You know, a lot of cops on the street, they're not very good at initiating conversations, talking to people, getting people, you know, to, to, to trust them, listening, being a good listener, giving people, you know, voice and and talking about what's going on. And I think coming from a corrections environment out into, uh, you know, street law enforcement, that was a huge advantage that I had over other people that were just stepping off onto working uh, on the road. And so um, that's, and I've found that throughout my career when I hire people that come from that environment, A, if it's your community that you're going from that corrections environment to law enforcement, you know, actually the individuals, some of the people. Uh, For me at that time, being in Arlington and then going out to work in the street in Alexandria, there was still a lot of crossover, same people. A lot of people on the street that I recognize from the jail environment. Uh, But you also then have to understand how important your reputation is, too, with with those folks, right? Because if you're not a very good corrections officer, you mistreat people or you have that reputation, that's going to follow you, you know? Right. Um, but that being said, I think, you know, knowing some of the faces and some of the, the names, one, I did learn some pretty good lessons when I got on the street that about how, how some people, how some of the uh, individuals would talk to you and, and communicate and uh, treat you in a jail environment was different than how they would act on the street towards you when you were then a police officer. Uh, it's a different relationship. They, uh, And then they also are in a, you know, out on the, on the street with other people around. They're not, they don't want to act like they, they like you (laughs) You Uh, uh, sometimes. So those were some interesting lessons to be learned as well. It's just a whole different thing, man. It's working the roads, a whole different thing, but, but I did learn a lot. And, and I was, I, I think I really found my fit when I, when I got out on the street, like I just felt like, I, n- I never questioned that I belong there. I never questioned that I was doing what I was meant to do. Well, and that's, that's, that's awesome because that's what, you know, when you, when you can, when your passion, you know, is, is pursuing your purpose, that is, uh, it, there's a lot of synergy there and it, it, you get into that environment. I know most of us uh, would, would say that it was those first three to five years, you, you know, you're just, it, you know, you're glad to get a paycheck, but you're like, man, I can't believe I'm getting paid to go do this job. This oh, is, yeah, man. You know, especially a- during that time, it, you know, it was, it was all out all the time. You know, I mean, I worked an evening shift, and you know, it was just crazy. We called it running and gunning. You know, you're just out there. If you were in the chase about every other day, you weren't working hard enough. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was something. It was crazy. Uh, and again, like you said, like as a young person, it's just like, wow, I can't believe I'm getting paid to be out here doing this stuff. But, you know, you have to do that, too, with the perspective that what you're doing is right and good. Yeah. And there's always guys that we will find in, you know, from then to now that it, their intentions or their agendas are a little different from that. They're the guys that make us all look bad. It's an interesting dilemma, right? Because we go through such a a vigorous screening process. You you really work hard to make sure that you're 
uh, hiring the best people of character and integrity that also have uh, you know, the right skill sets to be successful when we do put them in this in the environment. And it's, and it's a very difficult environment because every day, um, you know, when you go from the jail, like yeah, there's a reason everybody's in there, right? I, I mean, I know sometimes people think that, you know, the, j- the jails are full of innocent people. Um, no. and, and, you know, but I will say this, you know, jails are full of good people and, you know, it's good people that have made a lot of bad decisions and, you know, you know, just different little, uh, you know, one decision here or there, one poor influence here or there, and it can totally derail a person and uh, get them down the wrong path. But, you know, it's, you know, but out on the street, it's still, it's still a difficult job. And you're, you know, you're dealing with people in crisis, you're dealing like, especially, you know, people that are in, you know, significantly uh, involved in, in the, in the more illicit narcotics, you know, crack, uh, you know, that, that definitely, um, uh, that that has an impact on a, on a way uh, a person behaves. You know that you know makes them much more prone to violence. Uh, there's there's a lot a lot like some of the things like with spice. You know, her- heroin can be a little bit different. You know, different drugs over time have kind of had. You know, you can see a different influence. But um, but you know, you put people out in that environment every day, and then you're dealing with all. You know, it's it's ten. You know, eight, ten, twelve. You know, hours if not longer where you're dealing with people in crisis that, you know, uh, you know, and like David Simon in his book, homicide, right. The, the very first line in his book is, yeah, everybody lies. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, some tell big lies, you know, uh, some tell little white lies, but, you know, everybody is, you know, trying to tell their story and they're trying to manipulate things to their favor. So, you know, as, as a young police officer, uh, that was one of the lessons I had to learn, you know, you know, I, I, sometimes I might have been a, you know, a little bit too easy to to believe certain things. Um, at other times, I I didn't believe maybe when I should, but you know, with time and experience, you can start to see the difference, and you really develop a a, a level of understanding. But you know, in the end, what we're looking for is information. So, um, it, it doesn't surprise me uh, at all anymore. I think we do a really good job of of identifying, you know uh where our problems might be but i do think that we can do a lot better also um you know as as bad as some as things seem sometimes i think they could certainly be worse but you know like i you know always want to be a little bit better tomorrow than we were today and always look for you know continued development um so m- maybe that's a good transition for you know what what are some of the young less or the lessons you learned as a young officer where we start thinking about our individual choices as police officers and where, you know, where things can start to get out of balance a little bit. Well, I think certainly during that time, it, it was, it was all consuming to work like, and getting into like a street level drug enforcement and that sort of thing. Like we were, we were a small team of people that worked, you know, all evening and then we would uh, go out drinking after work and then we would get up and go to court every day because we arrested so many people. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to put a judgment on whether it's good or bad to arrest people who use drugs. Um, there's just, this, there's a situational element there that you just can't generalize that. But I will say that what we were witnessing during that time frame in, in the area where I was, was this complete devastation of communities. Yeah. Families um, just, the, people that just have that just weren't going to recover not because they were necessarily the users but they were the collateral damage of people who were either addicted or who were uh victimizing people within their own communities by selling them drugs and you know i mean i can't tell you how many times we get a dealer who would have you know their food stamps on them that people were trading for drugs or things like this where you're not feeding your children because you have to buy you know you, you all you can do is the next thing you can do to get another, you know, rock or in the in case of this heroin or fentanyl, it just, it's just, it's just, just, just terrible uh, cycle. Um, but during that time, you know, the work was all consuming and it was, you go to work, <clears throat> work all night, you hang out with your buddies after work, you get up, you go to court all day and you work all night again. And as you know, maybe you feel like you're physically recover when you're a young person. I know if I did that today, I would, have to sleep about two days after. Um, but, um, 
it, you know, you just don't see the wear and tear of that and of that, you know, physically, mentally on everything. Right. And the other piece of that, that's I think really relevant. And I think this still happens maybe just in a different way is that when you're going, whether if you're a patrol officer, you're called to call, um, if you're working in, you know, like a street level enforcement unit, you're always have these like constant repetitive adrenaline dumps all throughout your day, all throughout your shift, all night long, you know, you're, you're, you're zero to 11, uh, this many times a day. Right. And that just, that is so bad for you, <laughs> like for your physical being, for your mental being, your emotional being. And so I think for me, like in my career, I can tell you that um, once I got out of that environment and into an environment where I was working more in an office setting, I didn't realize that, like, how that was impacting me at the time. I was still a pretty young person, still maybe 30 or, you know, in my early 30s. And I thought, I just didn't understand that, like, some that what I was missing when I got off the road was that those adrenaline hits all night long. Right. Um, and then just, just wearing your body down to nothing. And so I found that like, for me, like I would, that would manifest in, uh, getting, you know, into bad personal relationships or making poor decisions in my personal life. Um, not doing things that were healthy to try to balance uh, my life. You know, we didn't have the same focus at the time on like work life balance. Like that wasn't a thing, <laughs> you know? And so uh, I think we have a lot more awareness of that now. And I think that's a big, a big area where this wellness issue really has to come into play. And where we have to have these honest conversations about what, you know, I've done multiple tours through internal affairs and also as a chief, you know, making decisions on discipline and so forth. And I've seen so many cases of, you know, disciplinary cases involving officers, whether it be excessive force cases or whether it be like cases of domestic uh, violence uh, reports or things like this involving officers where uh, it's apparent to me that these guys are just not able to manage, you know, their, the stress, the, all of the things that go with what they go through every day on the street. And so when you're not getting that thing you're used to having, you create that maybe unconsciously. Right. Uh, so it took a really like a long time for me to, to put all that together for myself, you know, I mean, I was in my forties <laughs> by the time <laughs> I figured that all out, you know? Um, but I think as we see high level, you know, high rates of divorce, I think we see um, high levels of disciplinary issues. I know cops are always constantly in financial issues um, that causes additional stress. And so I think when you have stressors that are outside of the work, it can become overwhelming. Uh, and also just not realizing where some of that comes from is, a, is problematic. Yeah, the uh, Kevin Gilmartin's work, and I'm sure most of the people listening to this podcast are familiar with his work, but it was, you know, that was kind of the, uh, the really the the first, I, I, I should say, big awakening of, you know, and his, the title of the book is Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. And here now you have a, a retired police officer that's now a psychologist, that is identifying the uh, you know the process in in which police officers uh, go through, uh, and in his work is you know while it was seminal at the time, uh, he's still building on, on his work today, and, and and we're learning more and more because you're right, there were no there were no resources back then, um, and I, I tell a story uh, to people that I know. I, I, I felt very fortunate. I got into the wellness side of things early in my career, not not necessarily because I was looking to do it. It was just kind of, uh, I started to come across, you know, while I was kind of on my own journey to improve my my physical fitness because I wanted to be, I, I wanted to give myself my, you know, put myself in the best position to make our tactical team as a young officer. I uh, started reading about nutrition. I started experimenting with different things, but uh, I, one of the books that I came across early in my career was written by a guy named Phil Maffetone. Um, and he was a, uh, he's from California, a doctor that was training uh, world-class triathletes, Mark Allen, a seven-time Ironman champion. And, and as I was reading his book, he, he talked about 
adrenal stress. And he was talking about the, you know, the physical, chemical and emotional stressors that everybody, everybody has. But that really captured my attention because at this time, I'm now like three years in, into two to three years on the, on the street. I'm working patrol. I'm working midnights, uh, you know, just really enjoying the, the career. But I'm also recognizing, you know, that this was, you know, man, it's uh, sometimes it's hard to sleep. You know, some days I wake up, I'm really tired. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, you talk about that, you know, every night. And this is another really uh, good example. I think when you talk to the average community member, it doesn't really matter where you're from, right? The you know, When you talk about what's stressful for them, uh, what stress, you know, what's the name, something that was stressful to you. Most of the things are more like passive aggressive type of things uh, in uh, you know, maybe you had a a confrontational discussion with um, you know with a uh, with a, a friend or a family member or someone in the community or maybe you know the one I used to say a lot is you know someone cuts you off in traffic you know and you swerve the wheel and you you're like, oh man I almost got in a crash and you feel that that rise in adrenaline and, and then it crashes and and I'm like you know if you can take those moments and think like how you know how you felt in that moment now put a police officer where every, you know, almost every single call that they're going on, there is an element of this, some a lot higher than others. So all night long, you're on that emotional roller coaster, up, down, up, down. And then at the end of your shift, uh, it's generally, uh, you know, depending on the agency you work, you know, and, and what the volume of work you're doing, it's uh, it's not just go home, you know, and, and now I've been working all night. Now I've, I've, I've got to write my reports. I got to do all the really mundane tasks. So you're on these emotional highs and now you're down here uh, in these, you know, where you, you have moments where you have to really focus on, on what you're going to do next. And, and it's, it's a complicated process that has a lot of physiological impact on the body. And then of course, we weren't necessarily taught good, good methods for de-stressing. I, just happened to be working out a lot. So I, you know, I kind of stumbled into a lot of these things, but, you know, you know, there's also, you know, uh, you know, people that would go to the bar and have a drink or two or, or more or go, or, you know, worse yet, go home and do the same thing in an isolated environment. And, you know, what Kevin Gilmartin referred to as is, is sit into the magic chair and decompress, you know, to do decompress. And it's, um, you, you never really cool, you know, fully getting that opportunity to completely de-stress uh, before you have to wake up and then do it all again. Uh, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and I think, you know, if you're, when you're operating, I mean, just think about this, think about um, your early career and how you, you know, did your job and stuff like that. And then think about like if you were a Lieutenant or a captain, you're later on in your career and you had to make a traffic stop. How did that feel? You do right. this every single day as a patrol officer, right? And you have this certain, you just are adapted to it, right? You're adapted to the adrenaline. You're adapted to all of this, you know, going on. But then later on, when you're not doing that all the time. Make one traffic stop and see how that feels. You can immediately feel it, right? You can feel the, that feeling in your gut. You can feel the, the rise of your, of your body temperature, your heart rate. And it could be something, I mean, as simple as a traffic stop. And, you know, I don't want to discount the importance of, uh, of how dangerous those can be. But my point is, we get, a, you adapt in that environment when you're constantly under that stress and you constantly are having those adrenaline dumps. Like there's an adaptation that occurs where you don't even know it's happening. Whereas, you know, a normal person, as you say, or say a person from the community or even an older officer or older command person who doesn't do those things, when you do it, you immediately know whoa, you know, there, there's something happening here. There's a, a thing happening in my body. And so, uh, and so what happens, I think over time when you're young and you're in this, you know, running and gunning mode or whatever, you just, you, you never come all the way down off that. Right. You're, you're, you're not zero to 11 every day. You're like five to <laughs> every day. Right. You just can't get, you can never get here. Uh, but when you do, then you get that trough, that dip, that really depression or whatever it, it can come out to be. Um, and I know uh, Gil Martin and others talk a lot about that. I, I'll tell you, uh, Emotional Survival, that book, and then and go into his seminars that probably, 
I probably had to go through it about three times before I kind of really got it. Right. I mean, you can, every time you sit through that stuff, you're like, Oh, well you think about it, but then within about two or three days, it's out of your head. Right. Because you're more focused on other things. But after a few times and it kind of sinks in of, Oh, wait a minute, maybe there's, <laughs> maybe I should be paying more attention to this. Um, and, you know, and trying to think about how, what are the things that I'm doing that are, that are kind of fit into this mold. Um, I, I, I think it's just hard. I just think it's hard. Like you're saying, you know, what the average person goes through on a day-to-day -day basis that are stressors has to do with maybe they, you know, don't like their boss or they got into something, you know, or disagree with a coworker or they had an argument with their significant other. And here we are, we, as cops, we deal with all those same things, but then also, the right. stress and the excitement and the adrenaline that's involved with when you are in a confrontation that is a physical confrontation. So with that in mind, I think, and again, this is probably, uh, probably if you could, if there's a saying, right, that, that youth is wasted on the young <laughs> because we're, you know, yes. we think that we can manage all these things. We think we can kind of tough our way through it. Um, and, and it's not a problem till it's a problem, right? And, and then it's a, and then it's a problem. Uh, we're you, you, some of the guests that we're going to have on this show uh, here in, in the in the next few episodes. Um, man named Matt Martin, uh, Doctor Bill Cromwell. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that stemmed from uh, Doctor Jim Greenwald and work that they did at, at Specialty Health and Reno, but starting to understand what are the physiological processes and, uh, you know, taking the work of Dr. Gil Martin. Now let's look, let's look under the hood a little bit. Let's do some blood work. Um, let's start to capture uh, what the hormonal process th that's going on in the body is. And, you know, without going into too many of the, the details in this conversation, really what we found is, you know, we're seeing police officers are gaining a lot of weight. Well, why is that? Um, well, what we're finding is, th is that they're insulin resistant. Um, we're finding that in anywhere from 50, 60 to 70% of the policing population. Um, well, what is insulin resistance? Well, that's the body's natural reaction to stress, uh, and, and trying to seek hormonal balance. You know, we're, we're burning a lot of glucose for energy, uh, it, which means, you know, we, we, sometimes we reach for the wrong types of foods and then, we're experiencing high levels of adrenal stress, but we're not uh, engaging as much in the physical activity that we should be to, you know, to compensate or to, you know, mitigate some of the, the damages that these stress can have because, you know, you know, stress is kind of another one of those uh, topics. It's a whole show in and of itself, but, you know, stress in and of itself is not bad. Uh, you know, stress, stress is the one thing that, that keeps us alive. It keeps us alert. It keeps, it keeps us adapting but too much of any one thing is never a good thing. Too much stress uh, without the right balance uh, can lead to a, a lot of problems. So uh, we, you know, we all kind of come to these things, just like you said, in our own, at our, in our own time, in our own way. But if we, if we think about that, uh, you know, from a police generational issue, what, you know, maybe, maybe an example for you, where, okay, now I'm starting to recognize that this is having some negative impacts on my life. So I'm getting some awareness. I'm starting to get some education, some, some training that's coming to me. That's rising, you know, it's, and it's raising my level of awareness of what potential problems I might run into. I can now start to recognize some of those things in myself, but what do I do about it now? So, uh, what, a, you know, I think that's kind of, a, you know, just a, maybe a segue into, we, we take these lessons that we've learned the hard way through a process of trial and error. And now how do we apply these to the next, the next generation of police officers to maybe, uh, you know, help them avoid some of the pitfalls, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they won't die 20 years below the national average, like which has typically been the problem, what research research is showing because of these issues. Yeah. I think if you work in policing, first of all, we talk about like these, you know, adrenal fatigue and insulin resistance and all these things that are sort of contributors to our post-traumatic stress syndrome or even a disorder because you can't, you can't, 
you're you're not having normal release of adrenaline in it, like you know you would as a normal human um and so there's a lot of impact of that mentally and physically and emotionally uh, I think we've evolved a long way in, in being willing to talk about those things and learn about those things and lean on uh, people who are experts in those things, right? And try to get that information out there. Um, anybody who's been in policing for any time, and myself included, we, we all know people who have uh, committed suicide, right? We all know officers who have committed suicide. Uh, and law enforcement suicide is a huge topic. It's a huge thing you could do two or three shows on that. Um, yeah. uh, but that, it, you know, is a direct result of us not take care of ourselves and each other. Uh, and, you know, even as far as we've come with, with the ideas of wellness and talking about things, we still have basically an epidemic of it, right? Um, and so these are things we need to confront and to work toward uh, trying to, to deal with. And so the more education we have for officers at right at the onset of when they come into the profession, the more resources we can offer them right from the onset when they come into the profession and help them manage their stress, their uh, you know, emotional and mental and physical health. Um, I think we have, we've have, we have some competing things, right, that we have to deal with when it comes to um, establishing programs for officer wellness in our departments. And one of those th longstanding things is always that, you know, unlike the fire department where we were able to afford people opportunity uh, to uh, work out on the job. And, uh, uh, you know, they have a different culture and a different environment, different schedules and different things that afford that opportunity. Um, we don't have that in law enforcement. We have, you know, we're not, we don't work often uh, in those type of, you know, situations. And then, and then as leadership, we have to balance staffing and, call volume and how do we get people where they need to be? Um, and we don't give them, we're, I mean, think about like the staffing, the, the recruiting retention issues that we're dealing with right now. All of us probably throughout the early 2000s at some point realized that we had to like adjust our shifts and do different models that enable us to put uh, our minimum staffing on the street to keep people safe and to handle the volume of calls that we're handling, right? So in a lot of places, we do 12-hour shifts. There's not enough overlap. You can't get people on duty time to work out because they're call to call to call to call. And so we have to be creative and thoughtful in how we address that as police leadership, right? How do we do that? How do you undo that? If you are on a, we already know, we know 12-hour schedules are crappy. We know that they're very unhealthy, right? right. But unfortunately, once we get on that, we don't ever have the bodies to undo that, right? I mean, do you? I mean, honestly, if you, any time you have a number of people divided by two, you're going to have more people on the street than if they're divided by three or four, or however many shifts. So if you're in a mid-sized agency or a small agency, you may not have the luxury of being able to not have those shifts out there. And so I think encouraging and incentivizing people is, is something that we have to figure out and be creative. I know there's departments out there doing good things. We need to get that out and talk about those models and how people can adopt those. There's always going to be guys like you, man, like that, you know, they're the younger officers that come in and they, they're fit and they want to stay fit and healthy. All the guys that wanted to be on the SWAT team were the workout guys. Right. Right. Um, and, but that's a small percentage of who, of the entirety of who we have. Right. And so what I've found over years is like when we set up, fitness programs in, at work uh, and, you know, so, so one of the things I did when I was a deputy chief in Alexandria, I did, we set up a wellness program and we had a, a, a functional fitness coach that would come in the morning in the afternoon. It was free. Everybody come and all the guys who love working out are all there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And all the people that need to work out, they're not there. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I, so you have to figure out how to diversify those programs and also how to incentivize them for the people you really need to get there. Because it's in addition to the fact we all know people have died of, of suicide. If you've, ever, if you've been on the job for a while, you've also known people who've died on the job from heart attacks. Um, you know, probably a huge percentage of people who over the course of their careers develop type 2 diabetes. You know, people who have 
you know, heart disease, you know, people who have high blood pressure. I mean, you know, all those things because this is what happens to us, right? We don't take care of ourselves. Um, and, and, and like, strangely, we have all these fitness standards for hiring and you have to be, you know, do it do a certain uh, whatever it is to get through the police academy. And then we're just like, okay, you're on your own now. You're fit and you're young and you're healthy. Go, go do that, that yourself. <laughs> you know? well, yeah. It, you know, it's, that's always one of those strange things when I talk, if you ask the average citizen, uh, they just assume that there are physical fitness standards for police officers. So that there, sometimes there's confusion, maybe when they see like a, uh, you know, an officer that's morbidly obese that's out on the street and they're like, well, how does that, you know, how does that person function in that, in a job that may require them to run or fight? Um, and, you know, and it's easy to, it's easy to poke fun at that. Uh, it's easy to make the donut jokes and, and, uh, but what I, what I like to point out is like, yeah, there's, there is physio, you know, the physiology is at work against them in those moments while we may joke about that, but you know, the reaching for the donut is the same thing as reaching for a bagel or drinking a glass of orange juice or drinking a soda, you know, going through the drive through to get some quick food, because that's the hormonal reaction to what's going on inside the body. And if you don't have a strong awareness of how that's impacting you, or you don't have a really good mitigation plan for those effects, uh, then that cycle can really, can really get to you. So uh, yeah, yeah. It, it creates a lot of interesting discussions. 2% of police departments have physical fitness standards. 98% of police departments don't last time I checked. Um, and I think that's probably still relatively close. So, you know, it, you, you know, you get into these, especially as a, as a leader, when you're trying, you, you, we're aware of these things and we're trying to bring programs in, but then there's a, uh, you know, there can be resistance that comes from inside of agencies. No, I don't want, a physical fitness program. I don't, you know, and, and I don't necessarily it's because you think it's because cops don't want to be healthy and cops don't want to be fit, but there's, there's a bit of fear there about what that might actually mean in terms of this could, you know, could this impact my ability to provide for my family? Um, but it, you know, it's also, it's also, you know, we, we realize now that, this is something that we should have been do doing 40 to 50 years ago, right? Right from day one, you know, when an officer comes in, when they're in that academy environment, when we are building, when we're teaching them criminal law, traffic law, uh, case law, you know, city ordinance, state law, all the things that they need to know on the technical and, and you know, tactical side of things. Uh, here, Here's self-management 101. Um, here are the things that you need to, uh, brace for in your career, because when we, you know, let's face it, when we talk about work-life balance, right, it, it, you know, it's a bit of a myth and, and, and probably in a lot of ways, because sometimes it's impossible depending on which, which job or which role you're in. Um, but number one, because we don't have the resources made available to us. Uh, you would have, you know, in order to be able to do some of the things that people think that we should be doing, you probably need to uh, a 150 officer police department would probably need to be 300. Um, and so again, when th that's another interesting discussion to get into, um, if you're working sex crimes or you're working a rape case, uh, or you're working a homicide, uh, you know, those first 24 hours, those first 48 hours, um, you know, it's, you don't necessarily have the luxury of, of working four to eight hours and then, and then, Hey, let's put this case on hold. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get my, like my pilot's mandatory uh, eight hour rest or, or the, my truck driver's mandatory 12 hour rest. We don't, we don't even have any, any rules like that in policing that in, to, to set up the boundaries for us. Uh, yeah, nope. I'm going to work. It wasn't uncommon for me at times in my early in my career to be awake 36, 48 hours at a time before I would sleep again and then come back and, uh, yeah, and I don't care how fit you are, uh, how you know what mitigation strategies you're putting in place. When you're working like that, you know something's going to give. Uh, and and sadly, I think what we see, you know, uh, today are, are really just kind of the ramifications of of just poor institutional guidelines that that you know that have been kind of reinforced over time. Um, you know, so that's why we do see obesity rates up, insulin 
type two diabetes, sadly, uh, high rates of depression, uh, PTSD, suicide, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer for police officers. It's not, it's not gunfire. Um, and, but we spend all of our time focusing on how to prepare ourselves to, you know, defend against that physical threat, that physical attack when really, you know, the biggest threat is, is really just managing oneself and, you know, how we're going to do all those things. I think we have evolved from where we were 20, 30 years ago, but I also think we're, we did it. We started in and sort of went through this evolution during a time when we were reducing crime. Our crime was very low, and now we're in a place in the last couple of years where violent top crime has kind of gone back to levels where it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, and the guys that are out there aren't equipped for <laughs> for it because they've not experienced it. Right. Um, you know, I think we do talk to people more about about these things but again i I mean you put yourself in the shoes of a 22 23 year old person they hear it they understand it but not everyone's going to really internalize that right until it becomes maybe an issue that they can't avoid um but nonetheless uh you know there's there's things we can certainly do but we have to figure out how to incentivize the the people in our departments who really do suffer from those things. We have to figure out how to incentivize them to, to take to take themselves and you know and to to get physically fit and to get mentally fit and emotionally. And so you know, obviously, a lot can can uh, can help with that when you uh, are running a police department. You, when you've got early intervention programs and things like that, are supposed to be able to identify those issues. But I think they identify them more from a, a place of, you know, where a person gets to disciplinary situations or when they are in, you know, multiple use of force situations where they meet these criteria before we actually intervene. Uh, so I would have to figure out a better way to do that and, and a faster, earlier place to intervene in those type of behavior, uh, you know, negative behaviors. Uh, and so that way we can hopefully, you know, help people go in a more positive path. But it's a tough thing because you said 98% of departments-ish uh, you know, they, they don't have physical fitness standards and that's because you don't have, if you can't, you can't really put a standard in place unless you give people opportunity to meet it while they're working, right? You have to pay them to work out. Who's got money for that? Who's got staffing for that? There's a, like I said, there's a competing interest here, you know, and how we're doing our jobs. We don't, we don't have the luxury that they have in fire service or the culture they have in fire service. Uh, you know, those guys get physicals, they get all kinds of stuff, but they also are afforded opportunity. Uh, for us, we don't get that. And I think police leadership has to get creative in how we create those opportunities. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And um, I, I do. And so I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want the show to seem like, Hey, we're just sitting there complaining. Right. I, yeah. I think what, what I want us to all do is recognize that uh, regardless of where you are in the country, we all have the same challenges and, big departments, small department, we all kind of hear the same thing. So uh, I want to change gears because here, here is, I think, a path towards one positive outlet for this. And when you and I uh, were talking a few weeks ago when we were prepping for this show, you brought up something that I thought was was really cool and really fascinating. And it, it was just more of a personal journey for you in that you're going through these this, this time where you're starting to recognize, hey, you know what? Uh, my work life balance is out of whack. It's just kind of, you know, it's affecting some of the things uh, that I'm doing. And then you had a friend because oftentimes we talk about, right. What's one you know, what, what advice that we give to young officers today is, is make sure that you have uh, friends and a focus outside of work, you know, something where you can reset, find a, a, the ability to de-stress. So you have a friend that has a unique hobby and comes to you uh and, and what was that? Maybe tell us about that. So, yeah, so it was a little bit the other way around in terms of like figuring out some things. But uh, when I was in, I'm going to say just past that mid-career point, uh, I was in my early 40s. I, I uh, discovered through a friend, uh, rock climbing. It was uh, one of these things where you know, I'm looking at all these pictures and then, you know, and she's going all these cool places and it looks amazing. 
And I've never been a person who had a lot of, um, you know, I never spent a lot of time in nature and outdoors, you know, other than going to the beach. And when we're at the beach, of course, we're, you know, having our mimosas and our Bloody Marys and getting uh, too much sun, uh, you know, and doing it all the wrong way. But either way, that was like my main outdoor thing. It's like, oh, let's go to the beach. Um, maybe ride my bike, you know, now and then uh, and play golf. That was basically my outdoor activity. And uh, so I saw this like rock climbing thing and I'm like, and this is like, it's not that long ago, maybe 20, 2009, somewhere like, like around that. Um, I was like, man, that looks super cool. You know, maybe I'll try that. So it just happened. There's a gym a couple miles from police headquarters. And so I go down there and do this intro thing. And I thought, well, I mean, I play golf and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm athletic. I can do this thing. And I got on this, you know, rock ball and I was like, holy crap, this is hard. <laughs> maybe I'm not as, you know, agile as I thought I was or as I used to be. And so started getting really into it. Um, and later on, maybe about six months after I was in, in, in the gym for the whole winter and stuff, I went outside for the first time and I climbed outside and I was just completely addicted at that point. Um, but I didn't really get one. I just thought it was a challenge and I really, it was, and I was getting physically, uh, more fit and, um, you know, it, it, I, it was just in benefiting me in all these ways. And I just enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. And once I got outside and in, in you know, when you're in these environments where a lot of people don't go, uh, I just was, I was just loving it. And it took some time though, after that, to kind of look back and realize what was this activity doing for me that I had been not neglecting to do for all these years since I was no longer, you know, a street cop in the middle of the crack wars. And what I realized was that that thing that had been missing since I wasn't on the street, the thing I talked about earlier where, you know, I'd had this exciting career and then all of a sudden I'm in, you know, management and I'm sitting behind a desk and then things are going wrong in my personal life or I'm not doing, you know, I'm not taking care of myself, not being healthy. What I realized was that that's what the rock climbing gave to me, right? It was an opportunity to get some of that adrenaline back, but do it in a healthy way. And also it was an opportunity for me to have an activity where I had a complete presence in that activity, like a hundred percent focus and presence of what I was doing and not having all this other, you know, things, other, this other stimulus that was like always on my mind, you know, and you, your brain doesn't spin when you're like on the side of a cliff, you're just thinking about what my objective is and what I have to do next. And then you have to know you have the physical uh, capability to do that. And so that was huge for me, huge, uh, total turning point in my perspective and my view of what really you like, how you balance all of these things and why it's important to be physically and mentally healthy. Uh, and after that, I would say you know, everything in my life got better, everything. Uh, and all the way to the point of, you know, I'm retired now in a place where I can look out my window where I can go climb thousands of rock climbing routes uh, anytime I want, you know, and I can also ride my mountain bike and my road bike and I can go hiking and I can do all these things to put me out in a nature environment, which is something, again, like I didn't grow up, I grew up like playing outside, but, you know, I, it, as a young adult and early, you know, my early adult years, I, I was in an, an urban environment. I mean, Alexandria, the Washington metro area is urban and you have to intentionally be outside. <laughs> you have to make it an effort to go outside and do things. So I never had that connection with nature before that. And, you know, now that uh, I have developed that, like, I feel like I just understand so much more about how important it is uh, to be outside, to have you know, fresh air, to be in an open space uh, and to participate in activities where you have that presence that can take you away from other things. And that is a form of meditation in and of itself. Uh, it's a form of mindfulness. But really what we're talking about is focus. And, uh, in a, in a bigger sense, uh, in, in what, uh, Stephen Kotler, 
I'll I'll, re- I'll reference his work uh, from the the uh, flow collective research is is finding flow states, mm-hmm. and um, we find that uh, focus follows flow. Well, what puts us into these uh, into these states? I think you know, people are are probably more familiar with the expression of flow through like the the in the zone. Man, you know, if you can think back to a time where your decision making seems spot on, you couldn't do things wrong. Everything, whether it's in golf or whether it's playing basketball or climbing, you know, climbing a mountain. Uh, in in, I'll bring it back to working the street, like especially as a young police officer, uh, where there are risk in everything that you do. Not, I mean, as soon as the radio goes off there was risk in driving to where you're going, driving lights and siren. I mean, we're, we're adding and we're stacking these risk upon risk and then we're getting there and we're, and then we're engaging in these unpredictable human uh, activities where, where, where every, you know, there could be a risk anywhere. And, and, and so when you think back to that adrenaline and what you were feeling, you know, there, the moments like where we're, yeah, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this because, we're literally working in, in these, in and out of these flow states. Uh, there there's, he's got a, uh, you know, a expression, what they call the challenge skills, sweet spot, meaning, you know, when, when you're new at policing, those traffic stops, every, it seems overwhelming. It seems really scared, but as you, as you build incrementally and you get a little bit better and a little bit better, your, uh, capacity changes as you go. And so it, it's like the first day of climbing uh, that wall, like, man, I'm not sure if I can do this or can I do this or, but I, I want to try. And then you do a little bit. Uh, and, and as long as you have the right safeguards in place, uh, then you can, you can build on that safely. Now, uh, if, if you go try to free solo half dome, you know, uh, <laughs> a little bit too soon, you know, there's going to be a splat, right? You're not making it uh, because even the most experienced climbers that do that, uh, that take on those biggest risks, you know, eventually they're, if the risk uh, get too great uh, or they get outside of uh, that challenge skill sweet spot, then, then there's the risk of the fall. Right. And, you know, that's medically, uh, uh, you know, physically and, you know, kind of metaphorically speaking, because, it can, it happens to a lot of police officers. Um, so that I think the, you know, the, the real lesson in there is that, um, uh, one of the things that we can teach young police officers is, is in these interests in things that you can begin to identify, uh, some of these positive outlets and the positive outlets outside of work will have that positive impact inside of work. It'll, it'll make you better at work. So, It's, but sometimes people think, man, I have to do just this. And if I want to be, if I want to be a better police officer, I have to do nothing but policing. When the truth is uh, you need to dose it appropriately. You need the right amount of, of that, that challenge for your skill set, the right level of training, but then you also need a break and you need to be able to, to, you know, re-energize, reflect, think about what you're doing and then, and then get back in it. So, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, well, you know, and one of the things I used to own a CrossFit affiliate, I owned it for a long time. Um, uh, my wife and I was, with some others and, uh, you know, really I got into that through some of the stuff that I was doing inside the police department. But, you know, in the end I started to see this transformation that people were having and it doesn't have to be just through CrossFit. I mean, if you find, if you can get people moving a little bit, you know, that within the, within what they're capable of, if you can get them to focus a little bit on the right levels of nutrition, then, and then you can start to measure, you know, their work capacity and some of the things that they're doing, what they'll find real quick is that, uh, if I just do a little bit each day, I can get a little bit better. And then that builds synergy. Uh, and you know, one of the biggest challenges that we would have is that CrossFit looks, you know, it looks intimidating maybe to someone who's, not in, in in great physical fitness, you know, they're, they're just not in great shape or they've kind of let themselves go for whatever, whatever life brings, you know, we're all, you know, we're all coming from our own place. And I used to have people all the time tell me, uh, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go get in shape and, and then I'm going to try and then I'm going to start crossing. I'm going to, I'm going to go lose a little bit of weight. Then I'm going to come do this. And I'm, you know, I was like, no, that that's like, don't think about it that way. I was like, just show up, you know, we're, you know, 
we're going to dose you appropriately. We're going to give you a little bit of taste of what it is. We're going to help you move a little bit. And, you know, what we found is that when you can build that synergy, people go, but, uh, you know, if you can get them there for three weeks, you probably get them there for three months. And if you can get them there for three months, then there's these huge transformations that occur. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, the parallels that we see in these kind of activities, and then also how it impacts us in work, because what we also see in, in the policing side of things is that that challenge skill set gets out of balance. Uh, and we don't have, you know, that that's when we can see, you know, careers come to an end. Uh, people make poor decisions under stress. Uh, good, you know, you know, even, even the best police officers, you know, they, you know, everybody has their limitations and what we don't want to do is push past our limitations. Uh, and, and so have, having somebody there you know, in police departments in this, in that, you know, sense of, of, of the word can be, you know, they can, they can create these nets and these boundaries and also these opportunities for people to kind of dose that appropriately. And I, well, I think as leadership, we have an obligation to create those opportunities, right? And so, uh, and it's challenging. So there's a lot to unpack with that, right? So CrossFit, um, I've done CrossFit and the thing that that's made that made CrossFit what it is, uh, not what its reputation is, but what it actually is, is the community, right? The right. idea of like having this supportive community guiding you through this this process where you can get more and more and more, you know, pushing yourself and, and challenging yourself and reaching new, uh, you know, new goals. Um, it doesn't have to be that, but, but that's the success of it. Right. And so in our departments, if we can create that type of environment without a brand of whatever, we could just call it physical fitness training, we could call it whatever the hell we call it, functional fitness, whatever if we make that available, we make it convenient and we incentivize it. Like, like I talked before, incentivizing it for people who really need it by, uh, for one, um, you know, leadership by example, right. Let's get ourselves out there. Let's participate. Um, I think that's a, a huge deal. I think if the people understand that you as, as a leader in your department, you, you support this, then you're going to get out there and do it, especially for leaders who maybe aren't as so fit themselves, right? Right. Uh, to make that a goal and show that they can, what they can accomplish and what they can do and how they support it. Uh, and that may mean getting up pretty early in the morning, or it may mean staying a little later in the afternoon, but somehow you have to be part of it uh, and you have to be encouraging it. And then you have to incentivize it to get the right people in there that you want. Like you got to sell it. You got to walk around and it shouldn't just be, we shouldn't even just be talking about police officers. We're also talking about like, you know, your dispatchers, communication, some of, those, some of the most unhealthy people that have no option but to sit inside a dark room for 12 hours. They're that's probably not such a hard job. Environment. Like that's a, they got to be available to them too. Right. Um, we did, uh, one of the things we did was we did the lunchtime yoga. Uh, which at the police department where, you know, if for people particularly that work inside uh, the administrative personnel or, uh, you know, communications people that could break out to do that stuff. Like there's a lot of different ideas and different ways to do it, but one it's it's gotta be something that's supported by your leadership and that's demonstrated by the leadership as an important thing. And I do think, uh, and this is one of the things that, that we were able to do that really, uh, improved like almost immediately our retention of, uh, of uh, officers in the first two years. And that is bring them in before they start the police academy, make them part of that fit fitness thing with other officers, show the community, show the culture, have them work throughout you know, the department, put them on the clock, start paying, get them into like how you want them to, you know, to communicate, to relate to each other, give them mentors, give them opportunity to see how things are working. And then when they go, they're already, you know, halfway or more where they need to be to meet those goals inside the police academy environment. And they're still connected to you through mentors. They're still able to understand that when they come back, there's that they don't have to stop working out or doing the things that they're doing. They have op opportunity here to continue doing that. And we want them to stay healthy and we want them to stay fit and we want them to have all, you know, 
And, uh, and I will say this, and I'm not to try to like throw in a shameless plug, but the coaching program is a huge thing too. And this is exactly where it fits in, right? Like you, you start from the beginning, let's take care of you mentally and emotionally, and then let's take care of you physically. And then let's make you a healthy uh, and productive officer who's doing the best job that you can do for the community, for the department uh, and for yourself, you know? Yeah, that's, um, I know we've been going for, <laughs> we've been going for a while. So let's, let's, uh, spend just a couple minutes on this topic and then, uh, and then we'll close it out. Uh, great segue. And you said a couple of things, um, uh, that I, I wanted to touch on because I, you know, one of the things that I've been afforded to do for the last uh, close to 10 years is I go back to our law enforcement academy. And, and I think every state's probably similar to this, but uh, you in in Indiana, you're required to when you get appointed to the chief's office or you become a chief, you're required to go through a 40 hour course that that, you know, this, uh, you know, these are experienced administrators that have to go through this course and where you're uh, you're going to learn the things that, hey, look, you know, when you're when you're dealing with budgets, these are the things that you can and can't do. You know, maybe things that you're just not familiar with. Um, but I, as I as I would come back and speak on panels at this, you know, just you know, being you know, open and candid. Hey, this is what works. The, you know, these, these are some of the things that I've done. You know, from media management or with other things. But you know, since wellness was something that was always near and dear to my heart that was something that I really started to pay attention to. And I, you would see in a room full of uh, experienced administrators that not everybody in there or very few people in there uh, really look like uh, they spent a lot of time in the self-care uh, side of the side of the house. And I, I think, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, sometimes the public's perception is, you know, police officers are, you know, inherently good caring people and they care a lot about what they they love their jobs they care about people they care about their communities and they tend to oftentimes put everybody else first and themselves last and so it's when, when you're dealing and you're working in such a stressful environment like that uh, that can take a toll on your on your physical health which then can have implications for your emotional health but in that room you know that's you know that's the challenge when you start looking around and you start seeing, Hey, look, you know, we recognize that we've got to start focusing on providing the right resources for our officers. And we would talk about that. Here are things that you can do. And, and you, you have done amazing things. And, and what you've done is, is you've taken what you can do, right? Because sometimes you just don't have the resource to do everything at once, but you start removing barriers and you start providing opportunities. And, and, you know, here are the things that we can do uh, rather than focusing on the things that you can't, you start focusing on the little things that you can do and we can make small incremental changes that over time can can have a huge impact uh, but that but that's hard and sometimes as when you're a chief it, maybe maybe you don't feel comfortable telling your if you're if you're not in the in the best shape or maybe your fitness has gone by the wayside <laughs> Maybe you're you maybe you don't feel good about asking your officers to do something that you're not doing yourself or you don't feel like you could do yourself. And so the easy choice in that in there is is to not do anything, right? Is to avoid it. And we know that's problematic. Right. Or to put it in someone else's hands, but not, you know, not lead by that example. I mean, we all have trainers in our departments, we all have people that do this stuff. And a lot of yeah, I find a lot of times we'll just let's make a well a committee or let's make a policy or let, let's let everybody else do this. But I'm, I'm important because I'm, you know, I got to go meet with city council. I don't have time to, to, to show you how to balance and how, how to be fit and how to be healthy. Uh, maybe, maybe one of the lessons that I learned late in my career too, was that, you know, sometimes I, I wish I would have found a coach early in my career. And I have, I have an interesting conversation with, with uh, another guest on the show that he, he differentiates between coaching and mentoring, you know, where, you know, and um, really likes to say, look, it, it's, it's fine to have mentors. Right. But coaching is a process. Uh, and, and in order to uh, get the best out of yourself, you have to be willing to engage in that process and you have to be able to make, you know, be willing to make sacrifices and decisions. And, you know, sometimes you just got to do some things that make you uncomfortable, learn to be, comfortable being uncomfortable and that's and that's how you make uh 
you know, really you make big strides. So for a police executive that might be listening to the show, um, you, you, sometimes the expectation is, is that I know everything, right? Because that's how I became a police chief. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be in this job if I didn't have all the, all the competencies, but then you realize when you get into that position, you know, that's just another, another level of finding out all the things that you don't know. And so every day, uh, it, you know, you've got to come to the, you know, come to your, to your job, uh, and your responsibilities with the understanding that you can't do it by yourself. You need a good staff and you need a good support system around you. And, you know, sometimes maybe the hardest decision is, is saying, all right, all right I, I need to do this myself. I need to seek out the, these types of resources for myself and now, and, and also for my officers. Yeah, I mean, you made you made good points on all of that, and I think uh, I think it is important to point out that mentor programs, mentorship programs in the department are very easy to start. Um, you just get at your framework, you assign in. What are you really looking for in a mentor as a role model? Uh, that's a different thing from a coach. Right. Uh, different thing from a person that's trying to work you, you know, through a point A to Z to get to the, you know, whatever the goal is in the coaching and. Coaching, especially with regard to like how we're doing it at Axon, it can it takes on a lot of different opportunities for people, right? Like it can focus on different areas that are specific. You can focus on nutrition, fitness, uh, financial health, or just gen, you know, or just you know, coaching in general to make you a more uh, sort of just have someone to, to, that's kind of outside of you that understands their their officers, they or police leaders or whoever their your peers are that you want to be your coach, but also, at the same time, they're not someone inside your department. So you're not talking to people who are going to be able to take that information and ever use it in a manner that you wouldn't want them to. And so I, I think coaching, that coaching thing is amazing. And I wish we had it. Like, I, it never existed when when I was in police. Never. Um, and it, I just, I think it's so valuable. I think, it, I, and so I think we're all in on that. And I think it does fit into where we want to go with the training piece at Axon when we look at higher performing officers to fit into, you know, being having the officers that are more well-rounded, that are mentally, physically, emotionally healthy. Um, and then, you know, that's just, that's one piece of it. And then there's other things that we want to start moving toward to pick that up, including the leadership training and uh, a lot of other things that uh, fall into where we are evolving. So wellness in general and police has really taken a, a much bigger role, right? And how we talk about it. It started with, with one of the, you know, it's a, one of the pillars of 21st century policing and that happened in 2015, but all the other things in 21st century policing kind of came first, right? And now we've come around to, oh, wait, this wellness thing is important. It was important enough for all of this like mixed group of people to say, this is something we need to focus on. And so the, and so the, the, the government is saying, oh, okay, yeah, we, we got it. We're going to give you some money to do that. And so there is, you know, federal grant money available, as you know. Um, the, and the wellness grants, again, for police leadership who might be listening to this, there's no match required for those grants. So you've got, what, seven, six, seven million dollars or something out there that you can get a piece of. You don't, there's no match. And it's all about just taking care of your officers and whether you use that money for coaching or for fitness training or, you know, for whatever uh, wellness aspect that you feel like is, is where you need to go. Like, how could you not want to get that? <laughs> you know, it's free, free money. And it, it really is. Uh, if you, if you really want to, to overcome some of these challenges that we're facing right now on recruitment and retention, uh, say what you will about the next generation. You know, we've raised them, um, you know, good, bad, and ugly, right? It all comes from, you know, the the generations that have come before them. And they do recognize uh, that uh, they do have some control over uh, how they're going to manage their futures. And, and, and they don't necessarily want the same things that we want in terms of that work-life balance and spending all that time. Um, and that, you know, that can certainly be, I think, uh, because it's been my experience that we've got some amazing, amazing uh, young people, young professionals coming into this career. And I, I'm excited to see what it's going to bring in the future. But that 
I, I think that's probably a great place to close this because we uh, I'm getting ready to go down a couple of other uh, rabbit holes that I think would be fun to talk about, but we're, we're right. over our time already. So I want to thank you for uh, being on the show. I got one more quick question to ask you, but I, cause I threw in a couple books and I was like that, you know, you know, this was great discussion. And, and I think I, hopefully the big takeaway for everybody, you know, in, in this show is that look, uh, we're, we're all fighting the same things. And I think we all have a lot of similarities in what we're trying to do and what we're looking for. And so it, there, there's comfort in knowing that you're not alone in this and that there are other people that are out there that have, uh, you know, ideas that have done some different things. And some of them may work for you. Some of them may not. Some you may be interested in some may you not, you know, you might not be, but don't be afraid to, to ask. So I'm going to give a couple of, of quick shout outs to a couple of books. Um, you know, one, you know, we talked about flow states and where I got interested in was uh, in Stephen Kotler's book, The Rise of Superman. I read this book years ago, and that's where I kind of went down the rabbit hole of, wow, what, you know, what is flow? What is the psychological and physiological uh, process behind it? And then, you know, Stephen Kotler's latest book, you know, The Art of the Impossible, you know, we start talking about rebuilding and reimagining the police and you start thinking about the impossible. Well, here's a great roadmap on you know, how to approach it individually, but give me a book. What, what do I need to read? What do I need to know? Oh gosh, there's so many. So it can be fiction uh, or nonfiction, either way. Well, either way. Yeah, I mean, I'm always, I always try to find good books to read because I just enjoy reading. But um, so the, one of the books I go to over and over again, and this is not anything related to anything we've been talking about, <laughs> but it's Robert Greene's uh, the, thir- the 48 Laws of Power. And I go back to this book a lot because there's so many historic lessons in here about uh, about just, you know, hundreds of years of like people scheming, conniving and and how they get away with it and what to do and not to do and how to uh, how to pr- put things in perspective. Because, I'm, you know, I think a lot of us cops and me, me for sure, like I don't ever approach things from like this a perspective of like gaming it or playing around or whatever, you know, like and I find that. So many people are involved in the political, whether it's internal politics department or your city or your county or whether it's, you know, national, whatever. I mean, people are always like gaming. I just can't think that way. I'm like, this is what it is. And here we go. Uh, so the book was very fascinating to me. And I go back to it often just to kind of get an idea of like, what the hell are these people thinking that are doing this stuff? So that's a good book to read. And also it's just a lot of history lessons that are involved in that. Um, for me, I also do read a lot of philosophy, um, uh, pretty deep into stoicism. I, and I started that journey again with the rock climbing. So there's a, a book called The Rock Warrior's Way. Um, and it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of lessons from philosophy. Uh, and then there's also the approach of, you know, how to handle the mental challenge in in rock climbing, but what, how this really applies outside of that is like, it's really about understanding fear, right? And uh, understanding like rational fear and irrational fear and when it's okay to keep going and when it's not. Uh, and being able to understand that really, for me, like as in climbing, it's a big deal because uh, as, especially as an older person, I feel like, you know, younger people, like if you ever, have you, are you a skier? Do you ski? I have snowboarded. snowboarded. I'm not good at it, but I have snowboarded. Well, for people that learn that stuff as a kid, they don't have the same limitations of fear that we have as older adults where we're like, oh my God, if that, if I hurt that, it's going to hurt for a long time. <laughs> and so fear holds us back from doing a lot of things, right? Especially physical things. Um, as we get older, we get more fear, not less. Right. And so that, that book, and then just the sort of philosophies around that and some of the philosophical lessons from that helped me understand. And then I also took, uh, have taken several courses uh, with the, the author of that, um, uh, of that. And uh, his, his name is, uh, is Einier. Uh, he teaches a whole course in, you know, how you deal with, uh, it's falling, they do falling it's all about falling fear of falling. You're getting, you're not going to have that when you're done with that. And it's about talking about rational and irrational fear, how to assess that and then how to keep moving. Um, and that those lessons, they are broader than just on a rock wall. 
I would say if you're gonna, if I would recommend one book to you with that, with that in mind, I would say read that one. The Rock Warrior's Way. I love it. It's on my reading list. Maybe yeah, I should have. Maybe I should have read that uh, before. Old, I... <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and I didn't even talk about this, but yeah, there it is. Oh, I like it. Arno, I L G N E. All right, add it to the list. Uh, yeah, the first time, the first time I jumped out of an airplane, uh, and that wasn't even in the military. That was just uh, sport parachute jumping. Uh, did a uh, yeah. That's that's a conversation for another day. But when you talk about fear and overcoming fear, that uh, you know, that that was a uh, definitely a flow inducing moment, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm sure it's the same way when you're climbing up the side of a rock wall. I think the lessons there are awesome in that in in the you know the in those books. You know what we learn is is uh, the challenges that we face today are not necessarily new and unique. Uh, they've been faced, you know, throughout history over and over again. And it's, uh, you know, our ability to to really battle ourselves and the things that are holding us back. And uh, I, I I think that's th those are some great books. 48 Laws of Power. I, I agree with that. Um, now I'm going to make a purchase on Amazon. Oh, you know, that's a good that's like a classic, man. I mean, it's it's a great book. And I just I started watching uh the, the this new show the serpent queen uh, i don't know it's just on um it's a new show on tv one of the channels one of the streaming channels right. and um, i then i went back and picked up the book again and started looking at because it you know it puts you in this this place of like trying to see how all this is going on how dirty these people are man they're just terrible uh <laughs> the crap that they do but, and, the, so, and so there's a lot of lessons in this book that you know like so like law number one is uh, never outshine the master and then he has all these historic examples of how observing that law has helped people and not observing the law has resulted most of the time in them being like brutally killed so that's <laughs> that's sort of the history lesson on that all right save yourself read it well hey it's been awesome uh retired chief tammy hooper thank you for spending some time with us on the Optimizer podcast today and i really enjoyed our conversation and i look forward to uh, seeing you again in the future i'm sure you will and i appreciate the opportunity have a great day all right going to axoncoaching.com check us out and contact us today until our next episode I'm 1042.